Lord is good. He's really good. And uh, I do appreciate a worship team that can sing good. We're singing to the Lord who is good. And the church still comes together. And you're good. Nobody said amen. By the way, I'll just jump right to one of the points of the sermon. Did you know God loves you? Did you know God likes you? God loves you and God likes you. And so, uh, in the Lord Jesus, in the Lord Jesus, I'm good. And uh, hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Grace Church service number two on uh, this first Sunday of September. So we've made it through the summer. And... Uh, we're making it through all the things and obstacles, and so we're live in the room. Glad you guys are live in the room. We're going to celebrate the Lord's table today, remember his body and his blood. We've got a lot of friends online right now. Glad you guys are tuned in with us. We're still together by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, as we celebrate communion, you can get your own juice and crackers and celebrate with us. Um, we get to do that. If you're on radio, we're glad you're on radio. If you're driving somewhere on radio, probably you won't want to celebrate communion, but if you get, that was kind of a joke, you know, like either, but uh, they can pull over and we're here to celebrate the Lord. That's why I'm here. We had a great first service and uh, I think we're going to have a great one here. We're going through the Gospel of John. Matter of fact, this is the first time we bust open into John chapter 1. So can, can I get you to take your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter 1. And I'm going to jump ahead just to pick up the main point you might say of today's service it is verse 10. John chapter 1 verse 10. So I'm glad you guys brought your Bibles. And uh, let me just share with you what John writes for us in verse 10. He was in the world and the world was made through him. And the world did not know him. He, that's the Lord Jesus, Jesus, he came to his own. His own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. You might say, well, now, Pastor Bill, how do we know that's talking about Jesus? Well, I read ahead, just so you know, and way down there in verse 17, it says Jesus Christ. I believe in the name of Jesus. But when you see the, the Bible talk about believing in his name, it's not just like the name Jesus, which means Savior. When it says that you're receiving him and that you're believing on his name, that would be all the characteristics, all of the attributes. That would be like who he really is. Who he really is. So his name is Jesus, but let's define which Jesus. Aren't you glad we got a Bible? That I don't have to go by religion or tradition or somebody's dream. I can look at the Bible and see how he's going to define himself. And by the way, his name is Jesus. Amen? I don't know if you've seen it. There's actually like these little yard signs now that says Jesus 2020. Like, you want him to be our president? I don't think he wants that job. He's already king of kings and lord of lords of a kingdom. And by the way, he's king of kings and lord of me and you. So when we read that, I just got to be careful here that those who believe in his name, his characters, uh, characteristics, his attributes, who he really is, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. We have the right, the authority to become children of God to those who believe in his name. You know, 
I really appreciate Ravi Zacharias. And he would always encourage people, unbelievers, and we might have unbelievers in the room, we might have unbelievers watching right now or listening, great, I'm really glad whether you're here or out there. But Ravi Zacharias would actually encourage people, just ask the Lord Jesus to reveal himself to you. No, Pastor Bill, you got to talk him into it. I can't talk anybody into it. Ask the Lord Jesus to reveal himself to you. And if you really mean that prayer, just read the Gospel of John three times. Ask the Lord Jesus to reveal himself to you. Read it three times, and, and, and he will. Do you know why? This whole book's about Jesus. And some of his characteristics and some of his attributes. I mean, it's not altogether who he is, but whoa, are we going to find out who this Lord Jesus truly is? And you say, well, hey, Pastor Bill, I already believe. Great, great. Then I would ask you to pray the prayer with me. Lord Jesus, would you reveal yourself even more to me to make sure that what I'm thinking I think I know about you, that I'm actually right in accordance with your word. That's why we've got the Bible. That's why this book's written that we would really understand who he is and how much he loves us and who we should be in Christ. Amen? Can I see the, the quote by Spurgeon, please? Of all I would wish to say, this is the sum. My brethren, Grace Church, preach Christ always and evermore, he is the whole gospel, his person, offices, and work must be our one great all-comprehending theme. Why Jesus? He's everything, and he's the only way to the Father. Father, I thank you that you brought us together today, whether in the room or online on radio, that we have the privilege to open up this gospel of John, that we might believe. I mean, that purpose statement we saw last week, it's actually recorded, that we might believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that believing in his name, that we might be saved, Lord, that those things that you would have for us, you love us. <laughs> you even like us once we come to Christ. That, Lord, truly, truly, the, the benefit of this book might impact me again, right now, today. If there's anyone, Lord, still seeking, still unbelieving, I pray, I pray, Lord Jesus, you would reveal yourself to them. You can do that in a dream. You can do that in a vision. You can do that in a conversation. Lots of ways. But I know that you use your word. So not my sermon, not my illustrations, but your word, I pray. And that, Lord, we'd be honest enough to say, would you reveal yourself to us? And for us that are believers, I pray for a deeper understanding. Not for our information, our heads, or some kind of test, but, Lord, for an intimacy with you, a deeper connection to you a deeper appreciation of how much you love us. So we thank you for the word. We thank you for the Lord. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, we thank you for Grace Church. Would you just bless us today? We welcome your presence practically, Lord. You know the thoughts of each one, that you would address that. You would answer that. And that you would find a group of people excited about the Lord Jesus this morning. As we get closer to your table, Lord, we'd prepare our hearts and to enjoy sweet fellowship with you. That's my prayer for my heart and our hearts together. It's the name of the Lord Jesus, and all of us would say. It was really weird last week. Um, I think it was Saturday. I was leaving the house. I was going to the library to study. And uh, as I was leaving my driveway, going by my neighbor Jeremy's house, I noticed his garage door was up, and there was no cars in his garage. 
And so I've got some good neighbors around me. Once in a while, you know, you leave the garage door open or whatever. And so I just stopped. And I thought, well, I can't leave. So when I stopped, Jeremy came into the garage and then came through it. There's, there's no cars there. And I said, hey, I just wanted to tell you, your garage door's up. And then he came. He said, it's the weirdest thing. It just keeps going up and down on its own. I said, really? He said, would you do me a favor? I said, well, yeah. He said, would you hit that button in your car to make it your garage door go up and down? Well, yeah. So I hit the button in my car, and his garage door went down. So I hit it again, and his garage door went up. I got the power. No. I thought, hey, Jeremy, <laughs> how did that happen? And he said, I don't know. I said, so I'm doing the math real quick. I got to get the live. I said, I said, okay, okay, okay. Let me think. Let me think. I said, okay, I will not hit this button anymore. So I'm not coming in your house or your garage. That's up to you. We've got to figure it out. Well, what had happened, because, you know, I tested it more. And sure enough, my button in my car that controls my garage, and my garage door is going up and down, but now my neighbor's is. So what is that? Somehow, somehow, my button got contaminated. That's what I would say. Really, I think when he was programming his, that I hit my button at the wrong time, and my button is smarter than I thought, and it picked up my garage door and his garage door, but I know that's got to get fixed. To fix that, I had to get my owner's manual out. Then I got to hit two buttons at the same time, you know, wait 20 seconds, and then it starts blinking like, okay, a memory raced, and so then I hit it, nothing happens, and then I had to recode that button with just my garage door opener, and it all works. And the last I saw this morning when I shut my garage door, Jeremy's garage didn't open. What you think you know about Jesus might be right or might be contaminated. What you've been taught about Jesus might be biblical or might be heresy. What you think you know might be making garage doors go up and down. You don't want to have them happening. Most people, they love Jesus as a good teacher, but have no idea that he's not just a good teacher. Some people think he's the brother of Lucifer created by the Father. Can I tell you the Mormons are wrong according to the Word of God? Some people think God the Father Somewhere along the line created his son. Can I tell you, we haven't stopped to listen to the Bible. So I'm not asking you to deprogram. I'm asking you to open up your mind and your heart and your spirit for what John says, that we might believe in his name. He doesn't say that in verse 1, that as we walk through Chapter 1, then all the way through chapter 20, don't worry, we're not going to do that today, but as we go through the Gospel of John, did you know what? The Word of God defines him for who he is. And when I understand that, when I receive that, when I believe that, I am a child of God. I have full authority and right. I am a child of God. Amen? So we know his name is Jesus. He doesn't call him Jesus until verse 17. He starts in John chapter 1, verse 1. You guys ready? This whole thing's about Jesus. Why Jesus? In the beginning was the Word, Logos. In the beginning, the Word's already there. 
In the beginning was the Logos, the Logos. And the Logos, the Word, was with God. Somehow God and Logos are together when the beginning happens. And somehow God and Logos are separate. And the Logos, the Word, was God. He was in the beginning with God. Whoa. I got to stop and think about this a second. What's the first thing you're saying to me? Logos. I thought you would say Jesus. No, that's 17 verses later. Very, very important. But we got to start with Logos. The Word. The Word. The Word. You see, if you have a Jewish mind and you say Logos, right away they think of God himself. They considered the Word of God God himself, same as. If you're a Gentile, a Greek mind, and you say Logos, that's the power that set the world in perfect order and kept it going in perfect order. Logos to the Gentile Greek mind was the ultimate reason that concluded and coordinated everything. It controlled everything. Logos. So both to the Greek and to the Jew, the Hebrew, when you say Logos, right off the bat, you got their attention. But then as you say, okay, the word, the word, the word, Logos, the word, was in the beginning was the word, and the word, the word, Logos, was with God. Now you got like two separate entities, and yet we know there's one God, and the word was God. Can I hear an amen? The word was God. What do you think that means? I think the word is God. He was in the beginning with God. So what are we talking about here, Logos? The Word, you say, who's that? Well, I read ahead, verse 17, it's Jesus, okay? We'll prove that to you in a second. But you need to know, mm, Jesus is God. This side did good, this side didn't say nothing. Jesus, let me just get the, Jesus is God. Not, hallelujah, amen, brother. Not little G God, not second God, not Father, well, then there's a son, there's a, no, no. He is God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, God. He's God. He's God. Well, he's my buddy boy. He's God. He is my best friend, but I have to remember, he's God. Well, I don't believe in God. I'll pray for you. Because you're not God. Albert Einstein had some students and he shows up for class one day. True story. One day, students uh, in one of Albert Einstein's classes were saying they had decided there was no God. Einstein asked them how much of all the knowledge in the world they had amongst themselves collective, collectively as a class. The students discussed it for a while, and they decided they had 5% of all human knowledge amongst themselves. 
Einstein thought their estimate was a little generous, but he replied, is it possible God exists in the 95% of what you don't know? You open up the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Logos. And the Logos was with God. And the Logos was God. He's in the beginning with God. Can I hear an amen? That's where John starts as we believe in his name. But then he says, all things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. All things were made through Logos, and without Logos, nothing was made that was made. Oh, not only is Jesus God, Jesus is creator God. Okay, once again, we have people over here saying amen. And once again, I give you guys, you know, I know, okay, maybe I'll just ignore you and just preach over here. (laughs) Jesus is creator God. You say, why is that important? Can I see the the verse that Michael read this morning? Thank you, Mike, for doing that, by the way. Uh, By the way, that was Mike's first time to stand up here with the Word of God and to read it. Can I hear you just give Mike a thank you real quick? And you say, why should we be thanking? Well, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. I knew the guy when he was hardcore and didn't care anything. But then all of a sudden, Jesus, the real encounter of change, to where even that Harley Davidson tattooed guy would come up here and <laughs> do the scariest thing in life, stand before you and read the word of God. That's a miracle. So I know he's got the right Jesus in the right place in his heart, and this was proof of it today. And he might be preaching next week. I don't know. But anyways, Michael, thank you again. But Michael read scripture for us. And did you catch the part right there in verse 16? This is all about Jesus. All things were created through Jesus and for him. Jesus is creator God. He created all things. uh, Excuse me. All things were created through him and for him. By the way, when you look in the mirror, he created you. You. That's part of his creation. He created you for him, himself. And you say, I just thought I was an accident. My mom and dad told me I was, well, listen, listen, listen. You're not an accident. No, evolution told me. Hey, listen, listen. That's why you should have been here Wednesday. No, all that stuff, you need to know. Almighty God, the Lord Jesus Christ spoke, and all this stuff came into being. And the Lord Jesus Christ Foreign man out of the dust of the ground, breathed into him. He became a living soul. And the Lord Jesus Christ formed you in your mother's womb before you even were aware of anything. You were created for Christ, for his purpose, for his good pleasure. Can I hear an amen? And you think, well, I don't know if I believe that. Well, that's why we have a Bible. Yeah, but I want to be a scientist. Angelica is. Matter of fact, she lives in Virginia Beach, Virginia, and she heard us on radio up in Washington State, and then she ended up getting transferred. She's a scientist with the government. She's working on the COVID thing in Virginia Beach, Virginia. She started listening to all her stuff and things, and she sent me this just last week. She said, "Uh, I have a degree in biology. I have studied things from developmental biology to genetics. I love science, period. I've always been told that a biologist cannot grasp a relationship with Jesus and their academic field. What I found to be true is that in whatever I studied, Jesus has overwhelmed me with his knowledge as creator. 
even with the secular book, as I studied, it was Jesus who explained to me the mechanism at which cell, a cell duplicates the DNA. Keeping my devotion with God's Word first helped me excel in all of my academics because Jesus was my teacher. My Creator tutored and overwhelmed me with His knowledge. Logos, the Word, is God. Logos, the Word, is creator of everything. Logos, the Word, is light. He's light. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness did not comprehend. The darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. That's John the Baptist. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him the light might believe. There's the word believe for the first time in the book we shared with you last week. It's 98 times the purpose of John's gospel is to get people to believe in the light, the Lord, the Logos, God, Creator God. To bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not the light. John the Baptist is not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light that was coming. That was the true light, the true light which lights to every man, gives light to every man coming into the world. I messed that up. Let me read it again. Verse 9. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. So when we go through here, we're finding out Jesus, how, what is he, who is he with his name? Well, he's the Word, he's God, he's Creator, and he's, he's the light. Not that light just comes from him. He, he is the light. It's one of his names. He's the life, but he's also like the light. You say, why is, it, why is that important? Well, when we get there, not today, but can I see John chapter 8, verse 12? Jesus said, spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. The light knows how to reveal himself in light to you. You say, well, it's all kind of shadowy to me. Well, then you need the light to show you the light of who he is so you're not in the dark anymore. Well, it's kind of like I'm outside looking in. You need the light to light you up. You say, what are you talking about? Because the darkness cannot overshadow it, can't comprehend it. The darkness, has, when the light goes on, what are you talking about? It's kind of like when you're growing up in church and you're even with the Bible and all this stuff, the Bible, that's all playing a part. It's all preparing you. And then you think, well, I, I think I see. I think I get it. I think I'm following you. I think I don't know. I don't really want to do this. I'm kind of feeling like I got a straight jacket on, but everybody tells me to do it. So I feel like religion. I'm, ah, and I can answer the question. I think I know who he is. I did. Ah! And then all of a sudden, the light goes on. Like a light bulb in your brain. Like I was blind, now I see. Like I was lost, now I'm found. I was dead, now I'm alive. The light went on. All the stuff I had heard, now all of a sudden it makes sense. I'm following him. He's the life and the light. Don't you love that the Lord knows how to do that? You say, well, you must have been listening like to Radio by Grace. I wasn't listening to Radio by Grace. I wasn't even in church. That's why Jesus knows how to reveal himself to you wherever you might be. And he knows when to do it. When he does it, follow him. Don't buy a pair of sunglasses and go the other way. No. <laughs> follow the light, who is the life. And when that happens, that's, that's like, that's when... You know that you know that you know. All that stuff, all those things leading up to that point of the light.
I, went on. I, I love it when I get to talk to people and sometimes in my office or sometimes in conversation, they have all these questions and they don't know if they're saved or not and they've heard these things and you listen to their story and then you just simply tell them the truth about Christ and what it is to trust him and then you can almost see it in their eyes. You can almost tell, you can see it when the light goes on. When they go from darkness to life. Amen? What are you trying to tell us? You should know when that happened. Well, I just keep trying to understand all of this. I think you need the light to go on as you seek to understand all of it. You see, Jesus, before he's even named, he's the Logos, the Word. He is God, the God. He's creator, the creator. He is light, the life. Excuse me, the light and the life. Amen? He's also the rejected one. Verse 10, he was in the world. The world was made through him. The world did not know him. He came into his own. His own did not receive him. The rejected one. You know how that feels, right? That boyfriend you were counting on and all of a sudden he's on his phone too much and then you find out there's somebody else and you feel what? Rejected? The mom and dad you thought would always be there for you and then you find out they don't want you anymore? Those homeboys that said they would Never leave you, and then you find out they don't want you anymore. For family, marriage, it can even happen with a church. Can I tell you, Jesus knows how you feel. And he's creator God that made every one of them. Comes into this world that he created, and they said no. So then he burned it to the ground. That's what I would do if I was God. Man, if I made everything, bankrolled everything, gave you breath and your heart beats and all that kind of stuff, and you said no to me, we're done. That's why, be glad I'm not God. I mean, you drive too fast in front of my house. We got a war going on, and you just drove and broke the speed limit, but it wasn't like a personal rejection. Not just from the world, he got that from his family. His own brothers didn't believe in him. He got that from junior high, his hometown right there, Nazareth. They rejected him. He got that from the nation, the very nation of Israel. He got that from me. For 16 years, I rejected him. Tried to keep my mom happy, go along with the, you know, the culture, the tradition, the church thing, all of that. But inside, I was saying no to the one who created me, called me, loved me, died for me. I was rejecting him. There might be somebody here. I mean, you're here, but somehow you're not all in. The light hasn't gone on. You're still saying No to the one who loves you. And I'm glad you're here. He knows how to reveal himself to you. And then he gives you the option to say yes or no. We're going to study that this Wednesday. You do have free will. You can say yes or no. Please don't keep saying no. He's also the accepted one. Verse 12, but as many as received him. Can I hear an amen? But as many as received him, and there are many that received him, and to receive means to claim, to lay hold of, to take. That is something we do. 
But as many as received him, to them he gave the right, the authority to become children of God. To those who believe, there's the key word again, to those who believe in his name, who he is, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That's what God would have for every one of us. To believe in his son, to receive his son. That's the great part. Rejectors can be acceptors. I can receive him. He is the accepted one, and I'm one that made that switch. I received it. He said, what is that? It's, it's, I've used this before. I, I really think it's, you know, if, if you order something on Amazon, and so they drop it at your doorstep, right? And then you look at it, you say, well, I guess I got it. No, you don't have it. They dropped it at your doorstep. You have to take the box and bring it in your house. You have to open the box, look inside, and then you have to put it on. Did you know all of that is receiving? So if you leave it in your mailbox or the doorstep, do you really have it? No, no. It's when you receive the Lord, when you believe in his name, when the light goes on and you open it up and you say, I think I'm going to put that on. I think I want to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And I'm still here. I am still learning about the name and the characters of all the characteristics of Jesus. But I know that I know that I know. I know I am. I have the right. I have the authority. Because of his name, I believe it. Not what I've done. I am a child of God. Not by my church attendance, not my sermons, not my praying, not the money I give. No, no, no. I am a child of God because I believe in the name of Jesus Christ, Logos, God, creator, light, life, rejected by me, but now received by me and believed by me. That's a great, isn't that good news that you can be a rejecter and then actually be one that accepts him? You go from death to life just because of the name, the person of what Christ has done. Amen? We're headed to communion. All of that to say, I might remind you the whole point of the Gospel of John with the except. Can I see John chapter 20, verse 31 quick? But these are written, all of John's Gospel, these, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. You say, what name? The name, the characteristics of the Lord Jesus Christ spelled out for us throughout this book. He's the God-man. This is where it gets really interesting, verse 14. He's the God-man, and the Word, the Logos, God, Creator God, and the Word, the Logos, became flesh and dwelt amongst us. We beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. One of the key verses, the Logos, that here the Word, God, in verse 1, all of a sudden, verse 14, the Word, the Logos, God, became flesh, became human, became man. Why would God do that? That God, who created man, would become a man. There's just one reason. So that the Son of Man, the Son of God, because he's both. He's fully God, he's fully man. But the problem is that God can't die. And the problem is we're all sinners. So if you don't have the spotless Lamb of God, if you don't have God himself that became a man dying in our place, we can't be saved. God loves us so much he became a man. Think about all of that, the incarnation. He did not sacrifice any of his deity, none of his deity, none of his deity. He was fully God that became fully man. He's not half God, half man. He's God, the God-man that could take my place. Talk about a God that loves us. He became one of us. That's why very subtly in creation when he formed man, different than everything else, he created man with his own hands. He breathed into man the breath, the soul of life. We are not little gods. But we have that thing in us that God breathed in us that can only be replaced by the Lord Jesus himself. And we are created in his image to where we are compatible. Somehow there's enough to where he could become a man.
You know he's still flesh, right? In a glorified body. Boy, he loves us. You say, why would he do that? Because he likes us. No, he doesn't like us. He just loves us. He likes us. You say, come on, Pastor Bill. How, how, do, you, how do you end up with that? When God created Adam and Eve, and they're going through a testing area there at the garden, we'll see that Wednesday. God still would come and hang out with them. Remember that? In the cool of the day, he'd walk with them. Why do you think God did that? Because he likes them. Do you remember even after sin and kicked out of the garden, and then what are we going to do now? God would tabernacle, would dwell in the midst of them. Remember the 12 nations or the 12 tribes around and God in that tent and then later in the temple. That word, the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. That word dwell is tabernacled. God came to be with us. So in the Old Testament, the tent and then the temple. Then finally God who wants to be with us so much, God became flesh and he tabernacled. The very tabernacle of Jesus Christ himself coming here so he could die for us. And you say, oh, by the way, he likes us so much, so much that today he wants to live within us. This becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit. And somehow God right here, and you say, you, but you really, yeah, can I jump all the way to Revelation 21.3? The end of the Bible, after the tribulation, after the kingdom, we read this. I think it's a key verse in the entire Bible, one of them. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them. They shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Finally, when we get there, you won't be worried about COVID anymore or politics anymore or economy anymore. I mean, when we get there, new heaven, new earth, everything's new. And we want to be, I mean, we're there with him. Why? Because God loves us. Watch this. God likes us. Now, I know that's hard because when I stand in front of the mirror and I say, come on, God, this can't be true. He says, no, I love you. I love you. I want to be with you. I want you to understand who I am and why I did it this way and that I created you for my own good pleasure. And I want to be in your midst. And right now he dwells within me. He dwells within us. It's, it's amazing to me. But this God who became flesh, the word that became flesh, God that became a human, to tabernacle amongst us. John says this. Watch what he says. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. We beheld we, John, and the other apostles, we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He's an eyewitness. We saw his glory. We saw it, glimpses of it at times, and then full-on glory at other times. We, we saw when the wedding was running out of wine and nobody went knew what to do and water pots that were filled and all of a sudden the best wine anybody's ever had. Just a little bit of glory. I was just fishing, couldn't catch nothing. He said, throw your nets on the other side. Glory. We only had a couple biscuits and a handful of fish. Thousands of people. We sat him down in groups of 50 and 100, and we saw the glory. Best sermons I've ever heard by the writer of the Word himself, speaking the things of God himself. We beheld his glory. I'm telling you, he was dead. He was deader than dead. Lazarus walked out. More lepers than you can imagine. 
more blindness and deaf and demons, demons, demons. We saw the glory. He's the glorified one. I was on that Mount of Transfiguration, and all of a sudden, his face, like the sun, like the sun shining in its strength. I heard God the Father's voice. We were there. We saw this glory of the glorified one. Then you have no idea, you have no idea when he was saying goodbye to us in that upper room and explained to us communion. He washed our feet. We saw the glory even as he took care of our dirty feet. The way he died. John says, I was there. I saw it. I felt it. I heard it. I smelled it. The glory. I know that upper room, the doors were closed, and then there he is. Real flesh, real blood. The glory. We only had a few days. And then sure enough, he ascended. I I was there, I saw it. He ascended to heaven. I saw him. And the Holy Spirit comes, I'm telling you what, he is the glorified one. He's the glorified one, I saw it. I'm going to write it all down for you. So you can understand his name. You can understand what he means. So that you can believe too. That's why Ravi would say, hey, ask Jesus to reveal himself to you. He loves to do it. Now read the book. Just read it. We're so blessed to have this recorded, not just John the Bible. I can go to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and I can actually I can understand my Savior. We can hear his voice. The Holy Spirit that he gives to us to bring to life these things. That I can hang out with God when so many things are, it feels like everything's being rejected. And then you find out he's the grace one. We beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace, full of truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. We'll talk about John the Baptist next week. Verse 16, of his fullness, of his fullness, We all, we have all received grace for grace. Grace upon grace, grace upon upon grace, grace for grace, grace on top of grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Can I hear an amen, Grace Church? He is the gracious one. Up until then, you got Moses. Up until then, you got the law. Up until then, you got Ten Commandments, and you're in trouble. Up until then, you got religion, you got all this stuff, and up until then, you basically have condemnation. Until the gracious one comes. That introduces a whole new ordinance, a whole new order, a whole new covenant called grace. Maybe we should change our name. Call this the Law Church. Instead of Grace Church, let's call it Law Church. The Church of Moses. How about the Ten Commandment Church? No, give me grace. Because I know who I am. There's nothing good in me. There's nothing worthy in me. Lord, I need grace. He's grace upon grace, the fullness of grace. He's grace. God loves us so much, he gave us his son. The grace of God. The grace of God. Grace. Not only is he grace, he's the true one. 
true one. But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. You guys know John 14, 6, where Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but through me, but by me. So gracious, but so truthful. There's just one way, one way, and that's through him. He is the truth. So when we talk about believing in his name, what does that mean? All of these things and many more things to, still to come. But he's God. He's creator. He's the truth. He's the life. He's the light. He's grace. Oh, by the way, he's Jesus. Can you hear amen for Jesus? He is Jesus. Finally, after all of that, he gets to, but grace and truth came through Jesus took 17 long verses to get there, but now we know who we're talking about, characteristics of who he is. He is Jesus. I went on my Blue Letter Bible yesterday, and I just looked up Jesus in the Gospel of John. Scott Davey, you can check me out on this, because I don't know. I only had so much time. But after the first time, I mean, there's like 270 times that John's going to name Jesus. And so I counted it really quick. It might be 273, it might be 267, but I think it's about 270 times. Don't miss the point. Jesus is the subject. Jesus is the one of the book of John. Amen? Amen. But he's also Christ. He is the Savior, but he's Christ, Messiah. He's the anointed one. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. He's Christ. By the way, he's my Christ. That happened when the light went on. I was a rejecter, and then I received him. And then everything changed. And he's still revealing himself to me through this word and through the Holy Spirit in life. And I just have to keep coming back to the Lord. Keep coming back to the Lord. One more point, and then we're done. We're going to have communion. No one has ever seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. By the way, he is the Son of God. You have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And you say, see, they're not the same. I didn't say they were the same, but there's only one God. Well, you can't have one God with three persons. Well, you can if you're God. And just so you know, can I see John chapter 5, verse 18? Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him. They're going to kill the Lord Jesus because he not only broke the Sabbath, but he also said that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. He's the Son of God, Creator God, the Word, God. Rejected the light, the life, received. I have the right to be a child of God, the gracious one, the true one, my Lord and Savior. You say, I'm confused. You don't have to be confused. You know how Robbie Zacharias got saved? One verse. One verse. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him his name what he's done what he's conquered should not perish but have everlasting life it's that simple he didn't come to the world to condemn it but that the world through him might be saved. Gracious one, that we might be gracious. Truthful one, that we might be truthful. Rejectors that are now acceptors, going back into a world that needs to see Jesus revealed through us. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for your son.
Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you were submissive and obedient to your Father. And that day when the Word was made flesh. We thank you that you are an example to us how to live. But Lord, your purpose wasn't to accomplish that. Your purpose was to die in our place. We thank you for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The good news that, Lord, you took our place. The Lamb of God, God Himself. And yet, man, that the God man could bear the sins of the world, bear my sins, and pay the price for my sin. That I can be reconciled, I can be saved, I can be forgiven. Because, Lord Jesus, you fully, fully paid my price. And then on top of that, you imputed your righteousness to my account. And by believing in you, Lord, accepting, receiving you by all of those things, it's like the light goes on. And I was lost, now found. By the authority of your name, not mine, the authority of your name, I have the right, the authority to be a child of God. Thank you, Holy Spirit, how you minister this truth to our minds and to our hearts. I pray for my friends here and the friends watching that, Lord Jesus, you would reveal yourself very specifically with your word, with circumstances, to the ones that need to see, the ones that need to believe. If you've been rejecting the Lord, I pray today would be one where you accept him, receive him, believe in him. As we come to your table, Lord, remind us again You really did have a body. It really was beaten. It really was broken. You really did die. As we come to this little cup, Lord, remind us. The new covenant in your blood grace upon grace upon grace as you bled out for us paid the price for my sin we thank you that we could celebrate together the life the light the salvation of Jesus Christ let me invite you to take the little cup right there that was in your seat. There's two different little lids on that, so you have to pull the back the first one. And then there's the wafer. If you could find that, get that wafer. Then there's a second tab. cup. Could I have you stand? He was in the world and the world was made through him. And the world did not receive him, did not know him. He came unto his own, his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, 
To them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name. Who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Father, we thank you for the body of your son, Lord Jesus, represented by this piece of bread. We thank you for the new covenant, Lord, your blood, Lord Jesus, as you bled out for us. As we partake together, I pray, I pray that we might be renewed, we might be strengthened, we might be encouraged today with the living Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name and for his glory we'd ask. God's people would say, enjoy the Lord, enjoy him.